All righty, and our next speaker for the evening is, well, my evening, perhaps somebody, everybody else's mornings, afternoons, uh, is gonna be Lee Belden. Lee, take it away. Thank you. Just set up the screen. Coming out okay? Just fine. Okay, uh, this is just going to be a quick summary of the work of the Data Quality Task Group 2 on tests and assertions. The um, Brains Trust for this group, uh, really going around the table here, this was a photograph taken in Gainesville, uh, one of the more productive meetings we've had uh, face to face, that's for sure, uh, is Arthur. John, Paula, Paul Morris and uh, Alex Thompson. We really miss him from the group. He was a major contributor uh, to the work that's gone on. And I would say I've, I've had a talk about it with Arthur. <laughs> I would think there's at least a couple of person years work in what you're about to see. Uh, it may not be obvious, but it's like lifting a rock up and seeing what's underneath it. It's always surprised every single one of us and just how complex some of this stuff is. Uh, there had been some contributions also from people like Tim Roberts and Christian Gondro and Ian Engelbrecht. Right, so what's the purpose of the group? Well, you figured we needed a standard set of core tests of biodiversity, data quality, in uh, single quotes, that can be used with occurrence records everywhere and at all times. It just seemed like a logical thing to angle towards, particularly because a number of aggregators are already doing some of this stuff anyway. What approach did we take? Um, as I indicated on the previous slide, uh, data quality is probably better rendered as fitness for purpose. We build very much on the work led by Alan Vega, which was his PhD on the framework, TG1, how to describe biodiversity data quality. We also build upon the work that Miles Nichols led on the use cases, uh, what is important to test, and uh, that done by stereotypic uh, use cases. Our task group is um, looking at really the framework for, for setting up tests, uh, definitions certainly <clears throat> specified in the language of the framework, but as Paul has pointed out in contributing to this talk, there seems to be a little bit of tension between the what we would probably call plain English, English in the framework terms. Um, I might run into that a little bit later. And one of the very early spin-offs led by um, Paula, uh, Paula seems to be into everything these days and it's a wonderful thing to see, um, is the fact that we really cannot uh, adequately evaluate fitness for purpose without constraining more than we do now, for example, the values captured under Darwin core terms. So Paul is leading some work on best practice for uh, setting up vocabularies that may be able to uh, improve us uh, evaluating fitness for purpose into the future. Okay, the tests are based upon Darwin core terms, or at least a subset of them. Uh, we have name related tests, space, time, and what we call other. In other words, what's the organism? Where is it? When is it? And uh, the other ones, a good example might be license or basis of record. The tests are all at the record level, but the results can be aggregated across any multiple set of records. So it's quite flexible. Uh, we have 99 tests that's gone up and down a little bit. Uh, there are a whole bunch of supplementary tests, which we've put aside because we are talking about a fundamental core set, which we think are widely applicable. They break down into 65 validation tests. An example would be year not standard, 26 amendments. Okay, an example would be day standardized. Every one of the amendments has an equivalent validation that triggers a potential amendment. Uh, three notifications uh, where we think we want to draw attention to a particular value. For example, data generalizations, not empty, would be a classic. <coughs> Excuse me. And there are five measures which provide some sort of overall summary of the results of the test 
on the on the record. But as I said, this stuff can be aggregated. And an example would be validation tests that were compliant. Um, this is in Paul speak, so I'm not sure how much justice I'm going to do with it, but. Look, it's very, in other words, we're really defining the test. How you implement it is largely up to you. Uh, a good example of the flexibility would be you can apply these tests on the acquisition of the data itself in the field if you really wanted to. Um, in the transcription pipeline, before or after aggregation, or even in the process of uh, doing some analysis on uh, occurrence records. Uh, in relation to parallelization, it's very flexible. You can run individually on distinct Darwin core terms. You could run in parallel on records or you can run it in order. It really doesn't matter. Again, just to emphasize, these are core 99 core tests that can be extended by uh, easy addition of new tests uh, into uh, specific environments or domains. Um, and as, as this thing says, tests can be assembled as needed, you know, so it's quite a building block. <clears throat> now, in terms of the way we see the tests being operated, we would sort of, we would suggest that all validations and measure tests be run, then the applicable amendments be applied, and then the validations and measures rerun again. Because if you've made changes to the to the uh, values, you really do need to rerun the validations, or at least a subset of them that are relevant to the amendments. Uh, I think the biggest thing that um, we've sort of got toward is the template, in other words, the description of each of the tests in a in a fairly formal basis. So we have a GUID for the test, a standardised label. Sorry, it's all capitals. Uh, the test type of validation. So this is basis of record, uh, not standard. Uh, I think the guts of the test is in this, what we call expected response. External prerequisites not met if the BDQ source authority, that's a term in the namespace we've developed. We do have a glossary or, a, sorry, a vocabulary of terms. So in other words, we're saying uh, external prerequisites are not met. We can't run the test if the source authority service isn't available. Internal prerequisites are not met if the basis of record is empty. Compliant if the value of basis of record is valid using the source authority service, otherwise it is not compliant. The dimension is other, and as you can see, namespace time are the other options. The data quality dimension from the framework is what we call conformance. It conforms to a vocabulary in this rare case. Uh, the warning type is invalid. We have a number of options there which I've just put in to give you an idea what that's like. Ambiguous, amended, incomplete, etc. The parameter in here is the source authority, but in this particular case, really there's only one source authority which is internal to us in Tadwick, and there's a link down the bottom in a standardized way that we have described what uh, you would normally want to use as the source authority. Obviously, in some cases, for some tests, that will be domain specific, but we have put a default down there. We've provided an example in here saying basis of record equals fossil, misspelt, not even in the terms uh, if it was, uh, as an example of a test failure, if you like to think of it that way. And the Two source minutes. of the test, thank you, has come from VertNet. We're currently working through generating test uh, data for each of the tests that uh, cover all of the contingencies. And this is only a subset, in fact, of the test data set for basis of record, but it gives you a bit of an idea on how that's set up. In other words, the first uh, basis of record value is human observation and the source authority wouldn't even get there. We're suggesting here in the response status that external prerequisites are not meant. The source authority is in fact unavailable. Uh, if there, it's empty, the internal prerequisites are not going to be met. Preserved specimen is a case where we get a compliant result. Ditto with taxon, and there's a few examples in there where it does not match the source authority. But as I said, this is a small subset, in fact, of the test data for basis of record. 
and we do need some help on this. So if anyone is interested, we would greatly appreciate it uh, if you could even help check uh, the test data for the 99 tests. The links, um, I've just included this. So if people want to find out uh, a little bit more about the tests, all the tests are rendered in GitHub. Uh, they're a subset of the issues in GitHub, but the link in there will get you straight to the tests and the test data. And uh, that's it from me. Wow, fantastic. Y'all have uh, come a long way with that. That's a lot of work. So does anybody have any questions on this latest development? Concerns, curiosity of how, how to get involved more? Looks like you've got a question popping up in the works in the Google Doc. Oh, and one from Matt asking if, uh, let's see, Anybody point to code where they are implemented in the wild? Yeah, there is a, a position in the template for code and uh, Paul has done quite a lot of the code for the tests, at least I think for all of the uh, temporal ones. I'm not dead sure where the rest of it is up to, but um, as you could see from what we call the expected response, it's gonna be pretty simple to code. Many of the tests do have links now to existing code, but not all. Excellent, thanks. Okay, and then from Nick, we have uh, amended values for Darwin cord fields would presumably replace the supplied values. So does this group recommend Darwin core add new fields for amended terms? similar to how we already have verbatim terms, or could this be solved by adding a new namespace version of the field? Yeah, the best way an idiot like me could answer that is to say, to quote Arthur Chapman and say, nothing should be overwritten, but um, that represents a problem. Uh, and it links up. One thing I didn't mention is the group is totally dependent upon the work going on uh, in the annotations uh, interest group led by Paul Morris. In other words, annotations, what we see as the outcome from the work that we're doing is literally going into the annotations group. But Nick's question's a good one. I might kick that over. Um, John, are you, are you online for that? Possibly he's babysitting. <laughs> I think everybody that's not a co-host at the moment is muted, Lee, so he won't be able oh, to, to right. respond until the general questions at the end. Yeah, okay. He should um, be able to unmute himself. That's okay. Um, but I think Nick's question is a good one. I mean, ideally, we would not want to overwrite anything. And I think just about all the aggregators have got terms, even though Darwin Core, for example, may not have a raw version of the term. Um, most of the aggregators have got uh, terms that are like that. So my feeling would be that, uh, as I quoted, we would never overwrite a term, but what is currently exposed may indeed be an amended term, but you would always be able to get back to the original of what the person actually put in. That's just the sort of fundamental rule that we would go along with that nothing um, that someone has put into a record should be overwritten. Excellent. Deb Paul would like to know, how can we get these tests into CMS? Mm, CMS? Collection management software. Ooh. That's one for Paul, I think. Uh, is he online? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm definitely not at the, the code cutting edge of this, as you probably already guessed. Um, but as I said, the, the tests are really pretty simple. So I think the implementation, as I said, it, you know, is wide open as to how you would want to implement them. Uh, just Lee, I'm, up. In a, Lee, I'm not, I'd hit Paul's there. Yep. In a uh, collection management system, the um, 
yes, tests could be integrated directly. The, the tests are agnostic as to whether you implement them in early data capture systems, in transcription systems, in aggregation systems, in analysis systems. Um, where, where you put them is, it doesn't really matter much. Um, we've been integrating the uh, event date related tests into um, MCZ base. Fantastic, thank you. All right, and it looks like we have one more from Yort. So Globy has some review rules and assuming that the GBIF ALA already have a similar set of existing rules. Can you elaborate on your ideas to get those to adopt your framework? Yeah, a few years ago when we originally got into this work, there was a undertaking by GBIF uh, IDIG Bio and the ALA that the tests that we came up with would be implemented. Um, so that hasn't been revisited, but I'm quietly confident that that will occur. Um, I know there is some work going on at the moment, certainly in the ALA on a data quality project led by Miles. And there is also an alignment project going on uh, dealing more with the back end stuff regarding GBIF and ALA. And I would hope as a part of that process, the tests would be included. It's a start. But ideally, we would like to see these things implemented, you know, at the data capture time. It's the best time to um, do it. And the only limitation, of course, would in some cases, of course, be connectivity. Absolutely. Thank you very much. We do have time for another question or two, if there are any, any quick ones out there. Everybody's curiosity sated for the time being. Oh. <laughs> One from William. In the background picture was the wine at the table, Argentinian, Australian, or Californian? This is a very important question. I was too drunk at the time. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably Californian, I have a feeling, but I don't remember. <laughs> Excellent. All righty. Well, if there's no more questions, we will say thank you so very much, Lee, for, for your presentation. And we can move along. We're making 